Well, I think uh, uh, Julio has already presented to you uh, uh, Professor Bill Bovillian. Uh, he, we, we, could, we know that he is a director of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology office in uh, Washington, D.C. He has a, a very important role in the connection of MIT with uh, the federal government. And he's a, a very great specialist about uh, science and technology policy. So now we will have a conference of uh, Professor Bill Boville. Uh, we told him it would last about uh, an hour, no? And uh, after we have a break and come back, and we'll have the comments of uh, uh, Professor Nicola von Ortes and Professor Mariano Laplan. So thank you very much. Uh, please, Professor. Andrea and Julio, thank you for the introduction. It's really an honor to be here uh, at one of the world's great universities and to see it for the first time. Uh, I'm here to talk today, uh, as both of those gentlemen suggested, about a deep problem in the world's ability to innovate. Uh, I will focus on the United States, uh, and my work has really been directed at the United States, but I think there's lessons uh, in, the, in, the, in the issues I'll discuss today that carry over to many countries, including Brazil. So I want to talk first about a problem that we could call taking covered wagons west, an old American frontier tradition. You've seen these pictures in American westerns. Uh, the United States is pretty good at doing the next big thing. Uh, don't like your technology neighborhood, Put your technology into a covered wagon, go across the mountains, open a new frontier. Opening new frontiers is, of course, a great Brazilian story, too. Um, this is very true in technology. The United States tends to stand up technology in new territories, in open fields. There was nothing quite like computing before computing. So we pack our technology covered wagons, we go west, we leave the East Coast, the legacy sector problems behind. But legacy sectors are <coughs> occupied territory. And innovations like to land in unoccupied territory. So in the legacy sectors, the new technologies have to parachute into occupied territory, and they will be shot at as they come down. The United States is just not good at going from west to east, bringing the technology back east over the mountains. We just don't revisit the established territory. We don't go west to east. We're very focused on the next frontier. Yet there are huge economic and public goods gains that could occur if we could change our direction. There's nothing wrong with innovating east to west, with bringing on frontier innovation. It's great. But the IT sector, which is the big technology revolution of the last several decades, is still only 4.6% of the United States economy. So we tend to do, for example, the United States will do biotechnology. It won't go back and fix its healthcare delivery system. But the big problems that the society faces in the US are owned by the legacy sectors. So issues like climate change and related energy, or food and water, are within those legacy sectors. A problem the US is having of jobless innovation, deep problems the US has in healthcare delivery, uh, the need to improve education and address inequality. These are all problems that are locked into these legacy sectors. And to resolve them, to work on them, we need to confront the barriers that face us in these legacy sectors. Interestingly, when I began working on this topic, 
we found very little literature. The whole focus of US literature in science and technology policy is really on the frontiers. There's very little discussion of trying to innovate in legacy sectors. It's a problem that's kind of hidden in plain sight. Uh, but to resolve these big policy problems, we have no other place to go but the legacy sectors, and how would we do it? So I don't think it's a big challenge, but bringing disruptive technologies into legacy sectors is not mission impossible. And, and we've seen this occur. So for example, the, what defense analysts in the US call the revolution in military affairs in our defense sector. Uh, is an example of this. The IT revolution transformed the communications sector. And there are sectors where we now see lots of potential for new innovation in advanced manufacturing, in new energy technologies, in intelligent cars, in commercial space, um, in online education. We can start to see what the pathways might be to bringing innovation into these legacy sectors. So let me just summarize up front a few take-home lessons, and then we'll get, into, uh, we'll get into the detail. So there are obstacles to disruptive innovation that hinder legacy sectors. And we need to keep in mind that innovation is not restricted to what we could call the shining lights. The barriers to innovation in the very disparate legacy sectors have a lot in common. They share certain kinds of rule sets, certain kinds of organizational aspects. And they are found in the United States, but they are certainly found in economies all over the world. Encouraging innovation in legacy sectors, I would argue, requires attention to the entire innovation process, not just one stage. So that includes supporting R&D, but it also includes the policy and institutional measures to confront legacy barriers and to work on scale-up and market launch of new technologies. There is an economic, political, social, technological context of innovation that can be as important as the innovation system itself. And then Manufacturing, and we'll do a case study around manufacturing in the U.S., is a legacy sector that's an important source of both jobs and innovation. So let's talk about these legacy sectors and some of their characteristics. Some of the characteristics are the need to, or the reality that um, legacy sectors and producers within them do not necessarily align with societal objectives. That the legacy sectors are defended by technological, economic, political, social paradigms, as well as numerous market imperfections. And we'll talk a little more about these in a minute. These paradigms and imperfections enable resistance to disruptive innovation, and they are defended by powerful vested interests. But these legacy sectors share certain kinds of common features. Now, it's important to understand that there, of course, can be ongoing, particularly incremental, innovation in legacy sectors. That kind of in innovation in a legacy sector faces no special obstacle if it fits the existing legacy sector paradigms. But if it's disruptive, there's a big problem. Um, and those disruptive innovations face high obstacles if they don't fit the prevailing business models and paradigms. So let's look at a legacy sector. Uh, and I'll look at fossil fuels in the US. It has certain kinds of legacy characteristics. A perverse pricing structure that doesn't reflect the externalities uh, and environmental or climate consequences. Um, this sector has a deep established infrastructure that's quite locked in. 
there are public expectations of low-cost energy in the United States that resist the entry of new alternatives that might cost more. There are established social systems that support that sector, career paths, university curricula, and so forth that supports the existing fossil fuel system. There are regulatory requirements that, creates, that create barriers to entry for disruptive innovations, as in solar or wind or other renewables. Uh, the sector undertakes limited R&D. In the U.S. energy sector, R&D amounts to less than 1% of the annual revenues of the sector. In an innovating sector, like, for example, semiconductors, R&D is approximately 16% of annual revenues. In the, in the uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector, where lots of innovation has to occur on an ongoing basis, uh, it's more like 19% of annual revenues devoted to R&D. But in energy, it's less than 1%. And that's typical. Because legacy sectors don't want to necessarily introduce change, they're locked into their existing system. Uh, legacy sectors are defended by powerful vested interests. And in addition, there's a series of market imperfections that affect these sectors. So perverse subsidies. So through the tax code system in the United States, the subsidies to the fossil fuel system still exceed the support for disruptive renewable technologies. There are network economies that need to be overcome. Think about the, the, the refueling system that spreads across the country with gasoline stations. Obviously, the U.S. never converted to biofuels like you all were able to. Um, all that network economy keeps that system pretty locked in. There is a problem with what economists call non-appropriability. For example, it's hard in certain circumstances to recover a conservation investment if you make it. The market may not allow that recovery. There's a problem of what economists call lumpiness. There may be a minimum investment size that is huge and very hard for new entrants to overcome in areas like carbon capture and sequestration for next generation nuclear, for enhanced geothermal. There's a requirement for collective action that is to connect lots of players to introduce disruptive innovation, and that may be hard to come by in a legacy sector. There's a short time horizon for financing new innovations. Uh, and that time horizon does not fit the time horizon for, for new technologies in, in a fossil fuel sector. Um, and again, in contrast, if the technology is compatible with the legacy sector, for example, fracking for natural gas fits the fossil fuel sector very nicely, you can adapt that complementary technology, that paradigm-compatible technology, fairly quickly. It's the disruptive ones that are problematic. So other U.S. legacy sectors include manufacturing, the electric grid, transport, higher education, healthcare delivery, buildings and construction, agriculture, defense. Um, these and similar legacy sectors constitute more than half the U.S. economy. Uh, as Andre mentioned, it's more like two-thirds. Uh, the resistance to innovation drags down economic growth. So a great teaching of innovation economics is that technological and related innovation over time is the dominant factor in economic growth. If you limit your ability to introduce technological and related innovation in most of your economy, you are affecting your ability to grow and therefore your ability to translate those gains into higher societal well-being. And you are also limited in your opportunity to, achieve, to tackle some big public goods problems. Uh, so these other sectors in the U.S. display many of the same obstacles to disruptive innovation that I described for the fossil fuel economy. I won't go through them, but they are long lists here. Now let me turn to starting to think about solutions. In science and technology policy, 
we have long focused on the innovation system, which is you in this room know could be defined as consisting of the firms, the institutions, the policies that carry out, that encourage, that facilitate and support research and development and innovation and the development of technical capacity. And we focus on these innovation systems. We focus on them at national levels. We focus on them at regional levels. We increasingly focus on them in metropolitan area levels. Uh, but there's another issue here, which needs to be understood when we think about legacy sectors, what we could call the innovation context. So the innovation system and the innovation context constitute an overall innovation environment, and thinking about legacy sectors requires us to think about both features, the innovation system and the innovation context. And this context is huge and includes cultural attitudes towards things like risk and competition and cooperation and industry university collaboration and includes macro economic factors, macroeconomic factors, access to finance, physical infrastructure and connectivity, income distribution, the whole incentive systems, whether they're supportive or disruptive of innovation. It includes the political system, the legal system. Really, this larger context can be as important as the innovation its system itself in determining whether innovation does or not, does not take place. And confronting legacy sectors require us to think about the context too. The U.S., for example, owes a great deal to, its, to some favorable, as well as it is affected by unfavorable characteristics in its innovation context. I won't belabor these, but every country's got a list on both sides, uh, and the U.S. certainly does. But again, a disabling innovation context can really derail innovation in all or part of a national economy. So in research work on this, we've taken a close look at Russia, we've taken a close look at Germany, at France, and at India, um, and looked at the positive features in the innovation systems and contexts and problematic features in all of these. So the model, I believe, can be taken to an international context. And the U.S., frankly, has much to learn from the strengths of other countries uh, in confronting its own weaknesses. So let's turn more into how we would tackle these legacy sectors. And in doing this, we need to understand better the models by which the dynamics of innovation operate. And we present five models that I'll discuss in a second, something we call the pipeline model, the induced innovation model, the extended pipeline model, the manufacturing-led model, and sort of one that includes all the others, innovation organization. So let me pull these apart with you. And three of them are kind of new ideas um, that we attempt to introduce and work on this. The pipeline model, science and technology scholars understand well. Um, and it's the dominant model in the US. It is what we could call a technology push or technology supply model. And in the U.S., our government supports research and pushes basic research, you know, kind of out into an innovation pipeline on the assumption that over time that basic research will get picked up by the other actors in that innovation system. So these new technologies develop and push into the marketplace. And again, that is the dominant model underlying U.S. innovation policy. But, of course, government-funded research is not the only way that innovation occurs. Firms are critical and dominate. And firms typically innovate through an induced innovation model. And that is more of a market pull or a demand pull model. So industry will see a market opportunity, a market niche, and then we'll undertake technology efforts to fill that market niche, to meet that market p 
potential market demand, often, typically, through incremental advances, i.e., modifying existing lines of technology to meet those opportunities. Um, so innovation can be induced by changes in markets or policies, um, and induced innovation can work pretty quickly if there are innovations that fit the potential market demand and fit with the, uh, fit with the firm's own paradigm uh, and business models. So that gives us two, and the next three are new ones we try to introduce to the discussion, although they will be familiar to you. The third model we can call the extended pipeline. It is also a technology push model, but rather than simply introducing basic research, there is governmental support at every stage through the innovation pipeline. And typically in the United States, our Defense Department supports this kind of model. It will support research and development, but also demonstration, test bed, and often initial market creation. So there's assistance of some kind at every stage of the innovation pipeline. There is also what we could call manufacturing-led innovation. And it's really important to understand that initial production, particularly of a complex high-value technology, can be highly innovative. Designing a product to fit a market really requires you to often redo the science as well as undertake highly creative engineering. Uh, many countries really organize their innovation system around manufacturing-led innovation. The United States doesn't, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. But for example, uh, Japan's creation of quality manufacturing in the 60s, 70s, and 80s is a great example of manufacturing-led innovation and China's innovation and the ability to rapidly scale up production, for example, um, is, another, is another example of this. Um, so this is an important, but in the US, an unappreciated source of innovation, but nonetheless important as we look at the overall dynamics of innovation. The fifth model we could call innovation organization. It incorporates the other models. So it goes beyond them to take account of the broad context and structure into which innovation has to be introduced. Innovation organization is what you have to practice to tackle innovation in a legacy sector, I would argue. Uh, you need to apply all of the models, you need to understand all of the models. You'll need to operate at every one of these, at the level of every one of these dynamics in order to to tackle the difficult problem of being innova bringing innovation into legacy sectors. And neglecting any of one of them puts too much pressure on the others. Now, getting the dynamics right is not enough. Legacy sectors also require change agents, institutions and individuals within those institutions that can push towards a fuller inner innovation environment um, and tackle the institutional issues. So the implications of these models for spurring innovation in legacy sectors um, really is that there's a full s uh, spectrum innovation policy working on system gaps. So you need to focus on the front end of the innovation system, uh, which includes R&D and prototyping. Uh, but you also need to look at the back end of the innovation process, the demonstration, the test bed, the production, the market launch stages as well. You can't only focus on the front end. You require a fuller spectrum approach. And there is an active governmental role in legacy sectors that may be required at a number of stages to overcome the obstacles to market launch. So, we know the dynamics. What would the steps be in actually thinking hard, in general terms, about how to introduce innovation into legacy sectors? 
First, you need to structure, strengthen the front end of the innovation system, the R&D through prototyping stage. There will not be innovation in a legacy sector without innovations. And this involves a series of tasks. I just enumerate some of them here. It involves forming critical innovative institutions to support the new entrant innovation. It involves creating a thinking community to build support and ideas. It will involve linking technologists to operators. It will mean connecting science with technology. And it also means that innovation that occurs on an island needs to get connected by some kind of bridge to decision makers and policy makers uh, that can tie the island back to the mainland to help introduce the innovation. So these are some of the ideas that we need to consider as we confront strengthening the front end of innovation in a legacy sector. But there are other steps too. We need to think hard about what the actual launch pathways might be for emerging disruptive innovations. How would they actually enter the marketplace? And this is going to be different for different technologies. For example, in energy, the launch pathway for renewables, for solar, for example, is very different for ex than, say, the launch pathway for the fourth generation of nuclear technology to be far safer and more efficient. Uh, so understanding how these technologies launch into what sectors is a really key step. And then you can tie support policies to the technology launch pathways. Step four involves analyzing the gaps in the innovation system. Uh, for example, in the energy uh, situation, the, our Department of Energy introduced something called ARPA-E, Advanced Research uh, for Energy Advances, uh, somewhat modeled on are noted DARPA in the defense sector. Um, so we introduced RPE to undertake breakthrough revolutionary R&D on new energy technologies, on technology opportunities that were in the white space where there was no work previously undertaken. Could there be some new breakthroughs that would really be game changers? So we created, we need those game changers in energy. We created an institution um, to, do, to work on those breakthroughs. It was a gap in the innovation system. Uh, we introduced advanced manufacturing institutes in the energy sector and a whole focus on driving down manufacturing costs. Uh, because unless the new energy technologies can compete on cost on day one when they enter the marketplace with the existing fossil fuel economy, they'll never work. They'll never scale up. So we looked at analyzing the gaps and those are a couple of examples for exa in the energy sector of filling those gaps. So this, this fifth step is analyze, first and four, analyze the gaps, and five, fill those gaps with solutions. So these are steps that we could think about as we begin to confront launching innovation in the legacy sectors. And to reiterate, innovation is not going to just happen in these sectors. There have to be change agents. Innovation in legacy sectors requires orchestration, pulling institutions and the individuals within them together to intervene to bring these new technologies about. Um, do, how do we know that these steps work? Right? Are these plausible? Uh, well, we've taken a deep evaluation of how our Defense Department was able to launch its revolution in military affairs back in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, these are the precise steps that had to be followed in the course of, of that innovation. And we can start seeing them in other initiatives the U.S. is launching, in advanced manufacturing and in clean energy initiatives. So let's do a quick case study, manufacturing. Um, it is a key legacy sector. 
Um, it has lots of those leg characteristics. But interestingly, it's a critical source of innovation. Remember the manufacturing-led innovation model. Uh, yet the U.S. has failed, frankly, to recognize that manufacturing is a creative stage of the innovation process. The U.S. has thought that R&D is what innovation is all about. It hasn't connected manufacturing, particularly, and particularly initial production of high-value technology goods, it hasn't connected the fact that that is a very critical innovation stage as well. You have to rethink the science and the engineering and the technology itself. Uh, so we in the U.S. think of R&D as the main source of innovation. Uh, we have done very limited R&D on manufacturing because we didn't recognize it as part of innovation. Other countries have not made that mistake. Germany, Japan, Korea, and recently Japan have all organized their innovation systems around manufacturing. Uh, and this has had a big effect in the United States. So after World War II, the U.S. had a system of innovating in the U.S. and producing in the U.S., innovating here and producing here. So it had full-spectrum innovation and got the gains at every stage of the innovation process, from the research stage all the way through the production of goods and distribution and sales and retail. Increasingly, the U.S. moved to what we could call innovate in the U.S., produce outside the U.S. And multinationals and startups began sending their initial production offshore Small and medium-sized enterprises in the U.S. that are the majority of U.S. production faced a thinned-out industrial ecosystem, thinner groups of suppliers, researchers, consultants, less workforce talent. This limited their ability to grow and expand. The result, of course, was the loss of manufacturing employment between 2000 and 2010. It came down by one-third of the U.S. It affected the speed of the U.S. economic recovery. It affected in the end, it's innovative capacity. So it, the U.S. has begun to run the risk of producing abroad, meaning that further innovations would have to occur abroad. So it's losing part of its innovation system, um, and it's facing as a result, because it's not doing the full spectrum of innovation gains, it's facing a problem of what we could call jobless innovation, that the innovations the U.S. accomplishes create less net new jobs uh, than if it had been operating in a full spectrum. So maybe we could apply the five-step model we've just been talking about to restore that lost ecosystem um, and smooth the way for new launch paths towards advanced manufacturing. Uh, and there appear to be new paradigms for advanced manufacturing. In other words, there appear to be technology advances that could be transformative of manufacturing in areas like smart materials and what we could call mass customization, the ability to make small lots of goods personally designed to customers at the cost, at the same cost as mass produced goods. Um, the entry of flexible electronics and photonics uh, the development of what we could call smart manufacturing. All these could be major efficiency gains and introduce new technology paradigms, just as the introduction of interchangeable machine-made parts and machine tool technology, just as mass production, just as Japan's quality revolution introduced new technologies with related processes with related business models. Could they be restored, restorative of a new kind of manufacturing system? Uh, and the U.S. is working on a series of models to try and think about this. Um, and the goal would be that this advanced manufacturing could maintain the U.S. innovation system, which is a key to its historical comparative advantage, um, as well as enable a full-spectrum innovation system again and less of this problem of jobless innovation. So let me wrap up now. 
legacy sectors are most of the U.S. economy. They resist innovation unless the emerging technology fits their existing paradigm, which is technological, that there are technological systems in a legacy sector that are established and hard to change, that fit the economic model, the business model uh, that dominates the legacy sector, the political uh, model that gives support to the legacy sector, the social systems that support it. All of this is a paradigm around the legacy sector that enables it to resist entry from disruptive technologies that might change uh, its business model. So many legacy sectors have important implications for public goods. And the legacy sectors are tied to some of the most important social problems that U.S. society faces, other social systems face. Uh, the legacy sectors share a series of barriers and market imperfections, uh, which I tried to enumerate. There is an innovation environment that is, it, it's kind of a new term and it includes the two elements we discussed before. The innovation system, which is traditionally the focus of science and technology policy, but a larger context that includes societal and cultural and economic factors. Um, Legacy sectors are found in all economies. Uh, they all have legacy environments uh, that I believe share somewhat similar characteristics. For innovation to enter legacy sectors, we need to understand much better the innovation dynamics, the pipeline induced, extended pipeline, manufacturing led, and innovation organization models. We need to think about all of those, not just one. Uh, and legacy sectors really require us to think about all of those in this innovation organization model, which incorporates the other four. Manufacturing is a particularly interesting legacy sector because it is both a legacy sector as well as a model for innovation and a jobs driver. So bringing innovation into legacy sectors, we talked about a five-step framework. Strengthening early stage innovation. In order for a legacy sector to innovate, it has to have innovations at hand. And the early stage R&D and prototyping system has to be adjusted to enable those. We need to understand the potential launch pathways for these new entrant technologies and then tie policies to them we need to think about the gaps in the innovation system and fill those gaps. And underlying this will be a need for change in legacy sectors for change agents, institutions and people within them working in a more systematic kind of way to bring change. Thank you.